<laughs> yeah, man. All right, so um, the topic. Oh, my mic way over there. Hold on, hold on. Let me bring this closer. So the topic of discussion is something I've been wanting to get into. Um, I have touched on it in a, in a lot of my videos previously in multiple different ways. Um, this particular one, you know, I, I want to get into it so it could refresh your memory as to the reason why, you know, a lot of the things that was brought up <clears throat> when it came to these gatekeepers um, throughout my documentaries. My wife and I has been exposing their agenda for quite some time. These people, there's a set group of people and they look like you or not, and they're working for people of pale skin that are in high top hat places, elite places. Um, a lot of people call them many different things. They are gatekeepers, but a lot of people may call them um, boule uh, because that's one of them. Uh, that's one of the secret organizations, so-called secret organizations, but that's one of the groups, Sigma Pi Phi, uh, that have done a lot against our people. But they were working with those uh, whites in high places to combat us from, how can I explain it, like more so challenging the narrative and uplifting ourselves in more ways than you would imagine. Like what I mean by uplifting ourselves is like starting our own nations, for example. These people were set in place, literally, to stop that from happening. <clears throat> and these people uh, that are the gatekeepers that are ahead of those gatekeepers that look like you and I also implemented some, uh, a lot of manipulation inside of the school systems. Um, if you remember one of my previous videos, I went over, my wife and I actually went over the Afro-American studies and that came from the gatekeepers. They were being taught this curriculum, this particular curriculum first. For some odd reason, they'll go pull some Germans from Germany, for example, because they were teaching their people a certain way of indoctrination and they brought them over here and held them up in high regard and slapped a label on them. Said that they were a part of a particular society that will only uplift a particular group of people, no matter their skin complexion. But in this sense, back in that past, it was only one set skin complexion. 3,000 degrees, thank you for becoming a member. Oh, thank you for being a member for 39 months. That's major. OCO. I also showed you how <clears throat> these people gave us the story of the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, literally told our people a lie straight up in school. And this is the reason why many of the adults are out there right now believing that we came from Africa. Um, and the majority of those stories started, or rumors rather, started up in the early 1900s. Um, and I remember challenging in my earlier years here on YouTube, I remember challenging everyone to go look at your individual's history, your individual family's history by record to see actually uh, what was recorded what took place with your family members? Okay. Because guaranteed it's not going to match up with what you were being told in school. It's not going to match up with that. These are totally different concepts. Uh, remember, I gave you uh, the term conceptualism because that's what they utilized. And they utilized conceptual arts in order to manipulate the people's mindsets into believing that this is something that happened within our history. These were complete strangers giving us our history. Complete strangers giving us our history. And of course our people fell for it because they were children and they were told to respect the elders 
respect the adults. Don't question everything. Hold all questions that you may have until the end of the lesson, but really it's until you forget to ask that question. They don't want you to think critically at all. They don't want you to think for yourself. They gave you your history and said, stick with it, nigga. This is exactly where you came from. This is exactly how you were raised. And it was always a group of people above you. You wouldn't believe that a lot of these gatekeepers know the truth. <laughs> Hear me out. <laughs> Hear me out. To the point where this is the reason why they attack people like me. Because they don't want the truth to come out. They don't want our people to be informed. They still want to control the narrative. The boule, for example, are people that look like you and I are set to do the duty of those that are ahead of them by way of their pyramid scheme and organizations affiliated with it. They have to do what they are told. And that is to infiltrate, disorganize, manipulate, lie, and betray their own people. And, and look, and you know, it's real bad to the point where I'm talking about it's a lot of these gatekeepers online right now. People are following their every lead. And the only person that came out and said that he was leading his people to a burning house is dead right now. But you wouldn't catch any other gatekeeper admitting to their guilt until they are on their deathbed or, or close to it. And this gets deep. This is, you know, I'm just warming up the conversation because um, my brother, hold on, correction, my cousin, let me say it correctly, um, is out, out there right now expressing his take on a lot of things that he went through and me and not me and this gentleman that I'm about to play his video, we already had conversations and, and our, actually our conversations are a lot deeper than what he put out there in these interviews. He went deep, but he went a lot deeper with me, you know, okay. Um, because you would think that he would have some type of, um, power to say no. And he does, but as many of you out there that think that he sold himself out and he didn't, because if he did, I wouldn't be able to talk to him. I wouldn't be able to reach out to him. I wouldn't be able to relate to him. I will be able to point out him selling his people out. I will be able to pinpoint what organization he's affiliated with. It's real easy. It's just that I take time to find this out. You don't. And now he out there right now. He's always been vulnerable, but now he's making it to the point where he said, fuck it. If they going to do something, do it. Because what he's standing for is what I stand for, which means that we need to do something for our people right now. We know what the problem is, but let's stop allowing these people to be our problem. When we could do everything that we need to do for ourselves on our own. Let me play cuz real quick. Yo, what's cracking? You know what it is. It's your homeboy Ice Cube. Um, and some of you may not have realized um, that I'm not part of the club. And a lot of you listening to me right here, right now, 
you're not part of the club either. And what I realized with the club is what makes them so mad mm -hmm. is when you don't want to be a part of their fucking club. Say it, Fred. Thank you, brother. What club am I talking about? I'm talking about the club of gatekeepers that we all got to deal with. Thank you, Miss Miss Morris. They know Thank you. Who they are, and they definitely know who they are. Um, a lot of people be like, "What? Who? 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 Come on, man, stop playing." Mm -hmm. So, ever since, ever since I put out the contract with Black America, you know they've been fucking with me. Here and there, this and that, but it's cool, you know. <laughs> I expect that. Um, you know, I've been working with, you know, on the big three for a long time. And you know how they've been fucking with me with that. I done made it, you know, plain, simple and clear what they've been doing. You know, the NBA been fucking with us. Now, a lot of people might say like, well, but Cube, you want to work with the NBA? Really? I don't give a fuck about working with the NBA. What I want them to do when I say to stop with fucking us with him is to stop working against us. You know what I'm saying? Stop doing that bullshit behind the scenes that we know you're doing. Just because they hate. Um, mainstream media, you know, they ain't fucking with us. And that's cool. We can do it ourselves. You know what I'm saying? We still on the rise without these motherfuckers. So let's go. We don't need them. You don't need them. Mm. It's up. You know? So what am I going to do? to deal with these motherfucking gatekeepers. Well, what I'm gonna do is go on a Fuck the Gatekeepers podcast tour. It's go time, Snow. I'm gonna go talk to everybody, everybody, you know, and get a chance to get my message out to the people. Um, be able to let people hear from me, you know, and, and you know, you might agree, you might not, but the, the important thing is, you know, for me to go on these platforms, say what I feel about what I think. And, you know, some people may get pissed off because I'm going to talk to everybody. I'm not playing. And, um, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a crazy summer. It's gonna be fun. Mm -hmm. Appreciate y'all. Always support the big three. Hopefully, I'm doing stuff that you guys dig. You know, I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this for people that's bored as fuck in the summer with summer sports and want something cool like the big three. So here we are. Appreciate you. Much love, much respect from your homeboy Ice Cube. Remember that. Now, it gets deeper because what he said he was going to do, he did. Okay. What he said he was going to do, um, went on a tour to handle these gatekeepers. It's not about exposing them like individually, but it is about exposing some agendas that people have no idea exists. Um, I'm not going to play all of them, but there's this one particular one. Uh, and I, I'm going to skip to the part that I'm talking about. I'm going to let the, I'm going to just let this play. Um, being there as guardrails to make sure. Oh, wait, 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 wait. This is this whole part. F yeah. 50 years ago. Yeah. And um, it's just done to really keep us bickering and, you know, chasing these words. Okay. Um, so and if, not really getting uh, to no the cut them of, off. Of, of the issues, which are most of the time very common if we really go down to the root of it. Could not agree more. Yeah. But you said it's 
being done to divide us. Okay, by who? Who's doing it? Well, who benefits and profits off our bickering and our division? You know, who? It's like follow the money. Mm-hmm. Names, Bill, but if you follow the money, so he, he, he don't know their names enough, well. You start to see, okay, <laughs> um, you know, this is an industry. Okay, let's take, let's take rap music. Let's take okay. it. Same people who own the labels own the prisons. Hola, hola, so, hola, hola, hola. Listen, he said something very important. The same people that own the labels. Oh, let me move this out the way. Hold on one second, y'all. I gotta move this out the way. All right, but the same people <clears throat> that own the labels own the prisons. Now, some of you may not know that or not putting it together as if it's not happening right now. Now, this, look, what I'm about to say should not be taken out of context. I want you to listen to what I have to say first before you give an opinion and try to take sides because this is not about taking sides. I'm only here to speak the truth. Now, what he said was something very important because what could we recall that most recently happened that got a couple of these rappers put in prison? And I'm going to bring this up to you all because I want you to understand that there is a gatekeeper and it's unfortunate because I like this guy as a rapper. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I liked a lot of his songs. You know what I'm saying? A few things I liked of his lyrics, but he sold his people out and I'm talking about Jay-Z. And the reason why I am is because he's a part of that agenda leaking everybody. Hmm. Okay, remember how he tried to come out there with Meek Mill to try to make it seem like he helping Meek Mill get out of jail, right? Okay, but why he put Tory Lanez in it? Listen, listen. Tory Lanez, uh, the situation with Tory Lanez and Meg Thee Stallion, and this is the part that I was talking about as far as y'all go take sides. I'm not saying that, I, you know, I'm taking a side. If, if, hold on, listen. If he did that to Meg, he definitely should be in jail. But the problem is, the problem is, is that that was never proven. It went off of somebody that's closely associated with Jay Z. That lady, what's her name? The attorney is the same attorney. But Rock Nation and Jay-Z is the owner of Rock Nation. Now, he sent that boy to jail. I'm talking about they didn't. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to understand where was the evidence shown that said that he actually did something? Because even Meg came out and said, and hear me out. She came out and said she don't know who shot. One of the one of the witnesses said that he saw a girl shooting a weapon he he saw firing he saw the fire coming from her hand as if she was shooting the weapon nobody didn't see him standing outside of the passenger door shooting that was nobody's testimony yeah danielle perez is her name or whatever perez now what i'm saying is is me me personally me looking at it from an investigation standpoint an, investi- an investigation got held up in court and people were paid off. I'm going to tell you why. Remember the video where his father, Toy Lane's father, came out and said that the eyewitness was pulled with the attorney uh, of Rock Nation on that Saturday and could have been paid off because that person changed their mind the day of the trial in which they were going to use that person as their defense witness. And then that person flipped the script. I said, "Uh Oh, this thing blew up. And it's all because he didn't want to sign with rock nation. I also saw a video of before, before any of this happened, 
I also saw a video. Oh, what, what was it? After or right before? I believe it was right after. Um, this situation happened between Toy Lanes and Meg The Stallion. He was mentioning how Rock Nation was trying to sign him, and he denied it. But okay, the point of me bringing all of this up here is the fact that they are going to use not only just the people that you may think is cool for some odd reason as far as their talents are concerned because apparently that could get in the way of certain people that you may think may not do anything harmful to our people you will put their talents ahead of their agenda you would say oh no with that person a great comedian he will never sell our people out that is the incorrect way of looking at this thing It's a lot of our people that look like you and I regular can act like you and I regular on a regular beat. They will be selling our people out and they get cash money from doing this. This is why. And it's not just the boule. For exa another example, right? Another example. Notice how. Hold on. Should I? Should I say? Okay. Hold on. Let me, let me see how I could explain this. Um. Notice how. Okay. When Cube, Cube goes on. Let me just call this a rant for right now because he's making it a statement that he's against the gatekeepers because the gatekeepers are against him, not trying to let him do what he do, just like how they would, are with me. You know what I'm saying? It's the same thing. But if, if you about truth and you about speaking the truth and you're not down with them, they're going to try different things to get you to give up so you could be down with them. When all of that has been exhausted, they will say, okay, fine. This includes, hold on, before we get to the exhaustion part, this also includes assassination of character in more ways than one, especially when it comes to social media nowadays, it's a lot worse. If you don't raise the white flag, they are going to continue and continue and continue to try to recruit you because they see that you are of a certain pedigree. Listen, they see that you are a certain pedigree Notice I'm utilizing that terminology that they want to have inside of their organizations because everybody else is, is of that same pedigree. If you going to beat, I'm going to just break it down. If you could beat the nigga up and keep the Negro in check, the, the white folks that's against you is all for that. They're going to pick you up and sign you up to their team. Notice how I said, beat the Negro, I mean, the nigga up and keep the Negro in check. Two different people. Who am I talking about? They put the niggas in jail. They put the Negroes on TV. You understand what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying? And again, they look like you and I, and they right in front of you. They can, I'm talking about, they can, I told you they can have YouTube channels and they do. And they do. All of a sudden, you see these people spring up out of nowhere when there's always a problem that's dealing with the black community. Oh, we need this. Oh, we need that. That's how you can tell that these people are associated with some type of gatekeeping because that's the only time where you see them come up in the public and be in the forefront. Okay. Like I'm talking about there. Now, considered a prominent individual temporarily, a prominent Negro temporarily, just to, 
to set a standard or to correct an agenda or to control the narrative. That's right, the blind leading the blind. They will lead you to a burning house. I've been calling these fools out since I got here. There's no if, answer, buts about it. Since the creator blessed me with people that want to watch and listen and learn, I have been stating that it's your own people that sold you out even more so than white people. They did more harm to you than white people. I know they're not going to listen to that. They're not going to like that right there. I'm talking about people watching ain't going to like that here. No, but what about slavery, Dang, These people did more harm to our people than white people. I know that for a fact because I am constantly doing research on these niggas and they sell us out every five seconds here and do the unthinkable and keep our people on the ground purposely. And y'all let these fools fly because you put their talents in front of their agenda. Oh no, he's so good at what he do. She's so good at what she do that you will get on your knees and kiss the ring. Oh, it's late night, so I'm gonna talk. I know them kids sleep. For those people in the back, can you hear me? It's your own people that's selling your ass out. All right. There's another thing I want to play. And you're going to learn. I don't care. You're going to learn. Shout out to the Chicago's very own. Steve Coakley, because Steve Coakley will recognize where, okay, hold on, hold on. And what I mean by that is, is that I'm a real authentic researcher. And so is he, he did his investigation into these people that's selling us out and you going to hear what he got to say, cause I'm going to play it. He is the reason why I picked up so many books on these motherfuckers to learn who they are and they are still conducting these agendas to this day. Prolonging the success of, uh, remember, remember how our people say we gotta unify? We gotta unify, we gotta unite. These niggas are in the way. Why you think they call gatekeepers? They at the gate waiting for you so they can redirect you. And it starts at school. And it starts at school. But Steve Coakley has been one of my favorites of all time. It's not somebody that I look up to or nothing like that. But it's one of the old oh, idolized. It's one of those people that has my all time respect. Because number one, at that time, he was pushing the so-called Afrocentric agenda until he exposed that. But that's another conversation <laughs> for a different time. Um, but let's get on these gatekeepers, because see what you do, a real researcher don't stop researching oh just because it fits some type of bias agenda that may live inside of your mindset no 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 a researcher continues on because researching is 
forever. <laughs> it's everlasting. 24 seven. And that's how I could tell the difference between me and a lot of other people that's online. That's how I could tell the difference between me and my wife and a lot of, a lot of other people that's online. There's a lot of people out there copycatting. That's number one, because they are afraid or can't do the same work. I'm going to play this brother and he deserves the utmost respect, even though it could be some things mentioned that I disagree with and that you may disagree with. But the overall, once again, the overall point still remains. So right here on Dane Calloway channel, Steve Coakley, get the utmost respect. If I see anything in that chat, I need them snipers, snipers! to knock them up out of here and let me see it so I can ban them permanently and they can't return. You disrespect this brother, you're out of here. Once again, I know he was off the Afro Afrocentric movement at one point, especially at this time, but later on he exposed that too. See, and they look, and then look, they got rid of him too. <laughs> May he rest well. That's true. What, 2012? Made his brother rest well. So again, round of applause for you and I. A round of applause for those of you that are coming in right now, checking us out, that's been watching ever since we started. And those of you that are clicking the like, share, the like button and the share button. And Steve Coakley and Dane Calloway. Let's get into it. Now, it's interesting that I mentioned the black press just for an example. I want to show you something just as deviation. The attack on the real community has been contained by the little opportunity we have to hear about it from our own press. You know, I was thinking about it. When we did the story about the boule, when the first story of the boule came out, which is that one, which appeared in the LA Times. Uh-oh, did I hit your drum? You still in? When we did, when that first story came out, that was July 18th, 1990, which we looked at right here. This is the first story about Sigma Pi Phi. That meant to us that the LA Times already knew about the boule. Hold up. We didn't. Okay, they, now at that time, keep this in mind. Now at that time, when he did the story on the boule and the LA Times posted it, he said that that meant that the LA Times knew about it and they didn't. Hmm. Keep in mind, they're just the middle entity to those that are at the top that are of pale skin. And it's only a set group. Uh, uh, Malcolm, Malcolm X used to call them the big six. And the only reason why he did that is because he, he knew they existed. He just didn't know who they are, what they were. Okay. He knew it was an existence. He knew it was something holding us back and he knew these people existed. But he called them the big six for that reason. Shout out to Malcolm X. He didn't know. Oh, but we know now. They already knew. And that was important because the boule, as I'm going to show you, was primarily responsible for attacking Marcus Garvey. But what protected their attack was that the whites refused to write about the attack. See, they like to play up black on black crime. Yeah. But not white-inspired, black-on-black leadership servitude dialogue. See, you see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? To do the black-on-black -black thing, but not under the certain things. Mm -hmm. Certain things are off of discussion because that's a plan or a plot. Mm -hmm. And not an incident. It's a series of things. So, we know the LA Times knew about the story. Precedence. And then when I got to Washington in November, this story appeared in November 4 of 91. We found that story in the Washington Post, where obviously they knew about the boule. They were talking about Wilder getting money for his campaign from the guardsmen. 
we need to have a discussion about the guardsmen. When I was on the board of the NAACP in Chicago, they had a chairman called chairman of the club set. There were 40 or 50 black men and women's clubs. The Lynx. That's Chad. the women. That's the women. Watch them Lynx. Don't slip. Don't sleep the Lynx. They like the woman boule. Don't sleep it. We're going to have a new piece coming out on the Lynx. The Four Horsemen, the Guardsmen, the Snakesmen. Mm -hmm. They got all kind of stuff going. You better find out about these clubs because outside of small little press releases in the black press, you never hear what they do. And by the way, remember the book that he's holding. Remember, I told y'all years ago to get this same book. It's called Bridges and Boundaries, African-Americans and American Jews. The book that he's holding right now is called Bridges and Boundaries, African-Americans and American Jews. So this is what he was referencing. This is what I was referencing in certain uh, documentaries of mine. So you can understand the relationship and the disembandment and the further nego the negotiations that happened between certain Jews and so-called African-Americans and who sold who out. And they did not care. Everything was in the book and many other books that I'll get into in a sec. And they make up the consensus behind the scenes about the containment. You see, the whites don't seek to stifle black leadership. They just seek to contain it. That's right. So that how do you allow a person to speak but say nothing? Woo! Becomes a strategy. This is you become proficient in this. So we know, says that the Boule and Greek letter societies represent the infrastructure of black America. The fraternal dynamic that permeates the black community. Now the white man oh, wrote this. Oh, hold up, hold up, hold up. Oh, hold up. That's so far. All right, calm down. That's so important. That it represents the infrastructure. Remember the boule called... All right, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Right there. Becomes a strategy. This is you become proficient in this. So we know, says that the boule and Greek letter societies represent the infrastructure... Boule and Greek letter fraternity societies represent structure of black america the infrastructure of black america the fraternal dynamic that permeates the black community now the white man wrote this that it represents the infrastructure remember the boule calls itself the inner circle of our race a circle within a circle which means that when du bois introduces the concept of the talented tenth what it really was talented tenth only <laughs> now, if you don't understand that, what only means, it means exclusively just us. And it means that the guarantee is that in spite of or in deference to 11 on down. Mm. This, is a, this is a policy that they cannot break. Mm -hmm. They can't break those policies. So we know that they knew about it. So it was no news to That's them. That's the sacred knowledge. And... Then we start finding these around the country. This is the black newspaper in Washington, D.C., the Washington Afro-American, with a uh, 1992 story dated Don't uh, forget, January 11th. Washington Afro-American. Remember I told you that these same people created Afro-American studies. I, I swear Steve Coakley would be jumping for joy with the stuff that I put out so far. The Washington Afro-American with a uh, 1992 story dated uh, January 11th, 1992, talking about Epsilon Boule Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity Annual Dinner Dance. And it runs down all this and it says, continued success to all the members of the area Boule, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. They had a meeting together, all three of them, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. In two hours, you can go from Richmond, Virginia, through D.C., down there up to Baltimore, Maryland. So you got yeah. three states you can quickly get to. And this list says there was approximately 65 members at the D.C. Boule. Some of them, some of them are our host, Samuel Massey, Grand, 
rep concert us or something. Hardy Franklin, Carl Anderson, blah, blah, blank, blank, blank. Wesley Brown, George Weaver, blah, 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 blah. It says here that uh, Vernon Jordan, it was Attorney Jordan and his lovely wife, Ann, who was white, <laughs> uh -huh. who invited <laughs> Mary, Mayor Sharon Pratt Kelly and her husband, that I he, met Sharon Pratt the Kelly. Had just returned from Sharon Pratt Kelly was um also the mayor of DC. I met her. And um to me, I thought she was white. Now, you know, I'm from DC. Those of you that are DC, Maryland, Virginia, remember Sharon Pratt Kelly? What was her nationality? Okay, but look, look how she tied it all up in it, though. The honeymoon, it was a real pleasure to see them so soon after the surprise nephews. We wish them much happiness. <laughs> but the point of it is, is that the kiss off to the boule is that of positiveness. So the question becomes, since they had never wrote a critical story of the boule, then the supposition is, is that the boule's history, what they have amounted to, what they are, is worth emulation and success as opposed to analysis and condemnation. A value judgment has been made that we weren't a part of, and the conclusion is they have hidden their whereabouts from us on an honest level and confined our dialogue to things that didn't include them when they looked at the power dynamic. When in fact, in the power dynamic, they are the primary consulted ones from the white race. Consulted ones. Thing. Now, this is, of course, <laughs> this is, of course, Jet Magazine, which in August is announcing the new head of the boule being put in. Now see, you're just looking at it, you don't, don't even see boule. Which means you gotta read into stuff, everything, every little picture, flip, flop, everything. Mm -hmm. you gotta have some way of grabbing your attention. 41st, show you right, baby. The 41st band of Grand Boule of Sigma Pi Phi fraternity convened in the plush. What we know about every time they meet, it's always plush. Mm -hmm. It's always plush. Western, Western Crown Center, hotel in Kansas City, Missouri. The immediate past grandsire Sire Archon Benjamin Mayor of Oakland passed the gavel to the new grandsire Archon Q.D. Perkins of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. African Americans working together for progress was the theme. <laughs> well, how can we have progress when we haven't met? <laughs> was the theme he said, how could we have progress when we haven't met? The Boule, Roy Roberts, manufacturing manager of General Motors Corporation, was the dynamic keynote speaker. An evening dinner lecture on the history of the Kansas City Jazz, an enjoyable picnic where more than 784 archons, that's 19, 7, 8, and 4, mm -hmm. no arbitrary number, mm -hmm. Archons and their families feasted on the delectable famous Gages and Sons barbecue. <laughs> were among the boule highlights. That was the highlight. <laughs> Accolades were heaped upon the general chairman, Elmer Jackson Jr., and his state of boule of Kansas City Archons and Archhouses, which is the wives. And the reason why they didn't care to post this in the Jet Magazine is because the Jet mag Magazine was a part of them. They were a part of that clique. Okay. Now that means, of and course, Ebony. not only is and John Ebony. Johnson a boule, but that he's known about it. He can report to us they more sold us about out. it. Mm -hmm. But in fact, again, the dialogue is about platitude. Here's another one. Found this one in New York Amsterdam News. The Amsterdam News is a brother who came out who was being attacked by the New York Post. Everybody really loved the brother uh, for coming out and counterattacking for being attacked in the New York Post. Uh, I forget the brother's name, uh, Tate, uh, no, not Tate, uh, 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 the brother, the head of the Amsterdam News, he was on Nightline one night. Tatum, Tatum, there we go, Tatum, that's it. Brother Tatum, and this is his newspaper in New York, and uh, he also was the first black press to do the ADL story in New York, uh, which is a very amiable, and uh, here, is in his paper, uh, given honor, uh, at the invitation of the three metropolitan and suburban chapters of the Sigma Pi Phi fraternity, many 
uh, something, a very enjoyable animal Christmas party was held at the Holiday Inn Crown Plaza. By the way, for those of you that don't know, Sigma Pi Phi is the boule. Sigma Pi Phi is boule. That is that Greek fraternity organization. Well, it's interesting. They got two crowns. They meant the crown in Kansas City, and the crown is the crown family who uh, owns General Dynamics. Uh, big time Jewish people who have attacked me personally. Uh, Sigma Pi Phi, which was founded in 1904. First 1904. Letter, uh, Greek letter, fraternity of African Americans in this country. The first one. The host chapters, it lists them. It lists some of the people who were there, judges, um, the mayor Dinkins and all of that. Say annual party draws, distinguished guests. Of course, there's no hint of adversion in the story, but it only means that even though the brother at Amsterdam was good in the fight, it did not in fact expose what it could have. Now, we were here just the other night, and we talked about this. This was our subject matter. We talked about that. Army Black Spy Network dates back to 1917. Woo, listen. And of course, in that story, we said that on May 3rd, 1917, that Secretary of War Newton D. Baker ordered Von Demond. So we got Newton Baker orders Von Demond, head of the Military Intelligence Division. It also said to set up the Army Spy Network against blacks. It also said again that his assistant to Newton Baker, Baker's special assistant was Emmett Scott. And that Emmett Scott was a person that we wanted to look further at. And what we learned by looking at Emmett Scott was that he was a Boule member. In fact, when this story broke, and even though the black press, was redoing the story without a theme. They couldn't go do what I did. I went and got my boule list in my boule book. And you see number 20 right there. Emmett Scott. This is listing who the boule members were in Washington, D.C. in the early uh, 1900s. Remind me to give y'all the name of this book. This is a totally different book, but I could give this to y'all. Remind me. I'm sorry, in front, in front of somebody. And sister will tell you how excited I got when they dropped that Army spy story, and I then put my theme over it, and lo and behold, bingo, pops out the boule man. Now the question becomes, are the other people who appear in the story patterned similarly after him? Remember, there were other people in the story, mm -hmm. which was our, our Moulton, Booker T's successor at Tuskegee, came aboard as did C.B. Ronan of Nashville, who sent Loving, the assistant to Von DeMond, a list of potential black informants and troublemakers. Mm. Sent them a That's list of potential. Actually. Look, y'all. Yeah. And look, and they be the judge as to who these people are. And they're judging it off of their pedigree. I'm trying to tell you. When they attack me, they attack him. They attack Cube the same way except for it's more modernized now because we're online. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. A list of potential black informants and troublemakers. Mm. Black That's informants Boulay and action. troublemakers. That's Boule action. It then says that Robert Church of Memphis, Tennessee, who's the first black millionaire in America. Remember, the first black millionaire in America was a spy. Mm. He was one of the wealthiest men of the race, has put me in touch with one prominent colored man in each of the largest southern cities. So he needed a network of prominent colored men to be available to provide to him the potential of identifying other troublemakers. So, of troublemakers. Getting the pre that's that's who they are. These are the gatekeepers, y'all. I'm not going. I'm not. I'm gonna stop cutting it off. When I was in the mayor's office in Chicago, I, unbeknownst to myself, was being flushed out by competing powers around the mayor, who just happened to have been the head of the boule. I didn't know it then. I didn't have the damn grid. Let me to fit let me explain. Let me explain. He was working up under the Chicago mayor. He didn't know what was going on at that time when he was working on the front of the Chicago mayor as the assistant. Oh no, Chi-Town, tell me y'all, I forgot what he was. He was up in there as far as the mayor's campaign. 
I'm trying to remember his official title, but um, it was definitely working to his excellence as far as research is concerned. But he did investigative work behind the scenes, uh, grabbing certain informations for, you know, uh, particular demographics having to do with certain groups of people. Well, actually, they, they were um, justly divided for certain reasons. Uh, his name is Steve Coakley. His name is Steve Coakley. Um, for that mayor of uh, Chicago. Ah, man, I'm trying to remember that his title. It had come to me in a second. But that's what he's referring to right here. I didn't have the damn grid to fit over what I was seeing. I, it was just any old attack to me. Just another old attack from a little faggot ex-government official. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Took it like any other attack. See, back then that word was, I hope but I don't get in trouble for that. I know <laughs> that he had been working against me and had served white males for many years and had done more than inform for them. Which meant that the boule, to me, has been counted on by other people. And this story, Going back into the Army's Black Spy Network, now you walk in, you walk in to more people. You walk in Joel Spingard and W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh oh. Just walk them right into this picture. Here. Ooh, look, y'all. Yeah. If y'all been on my channel, you know. You know, and see, that's why I gotta always give props to Steve Coakley for this reason. He ain't give a fuck. <laughs> and Du Bois takes his autobiography and dedicates it to Joel Spingard. Look in the first page. We talked about it last night. But then Joel Spingard gets revealed to have been a spy for military intelligence. Mm -mm. Which means that Du Bois, du Bois. must have been. Uh oh, hold up. Like the others were. Well, hold up, what'd I say? What'd I say? What'd I say? Let me calm down. What'd I say? What'd I say? And I broke that thing down. I knew W.E.B. was a plan here. Knew it, what called it. And I exposed the hell out of him. I'm telling you, Steve Coakley will be proud of me with the work, with the work I did. He would be. No matter who may dislike him or who may dislike me, I know for a fact that this brother right here, we would have been on teams. <clears throat> Big time. Big time. We would have had a fucking ball. You hear me? Uh, a spy. He was a spy, just like Booker now, T. Washington. This is a picture of Emmett okay. Scott. Just for the record, we can put it on the video. I told y'all. That's a picture of 1921 Scott. Tulsa, Oklahoma. They were the spies to come down there to infiltrate and send that word back to a group of people. And I told you who they were to say, oh, them niggas prospering over there. Oh, that's okay. We're going to send in the militia and shut it down within 24 hours. 1921. This is the reason why they ain't trying to put that story up. Because it happened more than once. You know, when they dropped bombs on Tulsa? It happened more than once in more than one area. That's why. And it was your own. It was your own people that did it. I told you. See, he went, I'm telling you, if, if he see what I got. As right here in Los Angeles in 1941, at the Boulay meeting at Griffin Park, 30 years into his Boulay activity, Emmett Scott becomes the 11th Grand Sire Archon from 1941 to 1946, and most prominently leading them through the war years. Now, this is the Boulay history book, keys us right up to the Memphis commercial appeal story. The selection of Emmett Scott as grandsire Archon was one of the singular events of Sigma Pi Phi's history, mm. which had significance for its war relationships during these years. Which has significance of war relationships during these years. Excuse me. Thank you. No live remote seller cast. No, no. <laughs> But I'm proud he came back. That's the brother that was shooting the pictures of night. He came back. We had a little talk. We, we feel much better. We'll be all right. We're okay. We'll be all right. It says here, now listen to this now. Remember, this guy is a spy against black people. 
But instead of being demoted for being a spy against black people, he was made the king of the inner circle of our race. It says, in the years Archon Scott had served during World War I in the years 1917 to 1919 as special assistant to Secretary of War Newton Baker. He was also as special assistant to the Secretary of War in 1917. The significance of this fool's title says a lot. That was also another secret society that I showed you all during my video of the um, Statue of Liberty, right? Franco American Union ring a bell here. <laughs> And they got tied up with the who? The Secretary of War? And they did what? They was trying to get rid of our people then so they can make room for more incoming foreigners. And they did it Motel 6 style and put up a Statue of Liberty to let them know where to go. They got everything ready for you. The pillowcase, the covers, the bed, and everything. We'll leave the light on for you so you can know where to go? And he got up and he was in charge of getting rid of our people, getting them out of the way simultaneously. Look at how deep this gets. of a volume, The American Negro in the World War, which was a phenomenon, seeing that that was 40 years before Rosa Parks. To get a nigga to go fight, couldn't even pee in a white washroom? That's heavy. Uh -huh. And what he don't know, what he didn't know, and maybe he did, I didn't see anything of that. I got a lot of his work. But what he didn't know is at that time, Rosa Parks is also a plant. Rosa Parks was also a plant. Okay? Because think about it. Why was she chosen to be uh, the story that should be put out there in the open when somebody actually did something very similar the year before? But for some odd reason, that person didn't fit a particular description or pedigree to be promoted inside of the, you know, the publications, newspapers, you know, et cetera, as a reason why things should be desegregated. Claudette Coleman, huh? Okay, Levante. See there? Okay. Uh oh. Ooh, ooh, Levante, Levante. Ooh, <laughs> Rosa Parks was a plant. Set it on fire, fire. This entire time, and so was so Martin Luther King. That. So the black press could have told us in reviewing history like it does and you know black press does give you a lot of negro history watch it carefully it gives you a lot of negro history now we know they've given us the short eye history yeah they could have they could have went deeper and explained better the real theme that held our history together our history and, and brother marcus said something that was really an honor to me and not in a disrespect to anyone he said steve you know there have been a lot of people looking at this Garvey thing, but I never heard this theme come back of proving Garvey being attacked from an organized group of white men, black men, whose loyalty was the white men. In other words, we've almost gotten it so tight that it could be criminal charges. Mm, all right. That's See, right. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's the evidence has weighed in so strong now that, that it wasn't just a catch. See, everybody always says, well, what did the boule do wrong? <laughs> you know what I mean? That, that's a logical <laughs> question. Well, what do you holding against it and uh what we holding against that's, it that's uh huh about genocide that's uh, assistance to what we call co-assistance to genocide mm. that's, that's, right. Mm. that's right that's right mm. and we be uh up on that it's go time you know? <laughs> and of course we remember we talked about the other night and of course you can't see that at all now you won't be able to see it but we talked about how they they utilized the Klan in the spy network. Uh -oh. That they could always count on the Klan of keeping track on a nigga. So the army used the boule to spot out the troublemakers. 
but use the Klan to spot the niggas. Now, what's the difference? You needed two different groups because the Klan didn't have enough money to spot out these niggas. Because they Klan couldn't go where these niggas had the privilege of being at, which was so close to the white man that the Klan couldn't get that close. Mm -mm. So the Klan had to supervise po niggas. Mm. Mm. That's, that's, that's about the way it broke down. That's exactly, look, look, uh, look, it lined up. It lined right up, separated them in groups. This is the reason why they made sure that they promoted that black term for a particular reason. I broke that down in a couple of videos, but I got a newer one coming. My wife and I are cooking up right now that we're going to expose that term black because they utilize that same method in order for you to start calling each other black for a particular reason. And it's a code word, just like Negro and Nick. Same way. And it's working the same way way and it be the gatekeepers out there promoting this to you to keep that narrative flowing holding you up and, and, and so that they had to sort it out about who got to do what now we don't want to forget this now this is uh how one man built an empire and i'm gonna blow that little chart up there for you uh let me see what i gotta do here i think i I'm gonna blow it up uh, don't look like it's gonna get no better. But what that chart chart tells you is how many chapters Marcus Garvey had in how many places? Cuba, 52 branches. Now, number of branches. He promoted Garvey. Distribution of UNIA branches. Cuba, 52. I know that Panama, Garvey was a traitor also. He did. Trinidad, 30. Costa this is why I disagree with him, man. I see where he went. 11. Honduras, but eight, I went South further. Africa, eight. British Guyana, seven. Colombia, six. So I'm not going to hold Dominican this against Republic, him. Five. Guatemala, five. Nicaragua, five. Barbados, four. British Honduras, four. Mexico, four. Sierra Leone, three. England, three. Gold Coast, two. Liberia, two. Bahamas, two. We have yet in the history, now this don't, this don't even include Harlem, Chicago, this ain't even concluding in the continent of so-called America, we have yet to come back that strong ever. That's right. And we ain't never really been told how deep brother was in. They have not told us how close Marcus Garvey got to the people we were after them. Now, see, it's a very important that he said that because I wanted to see how far Marcus Garvey got. And then I did my research even further and found out that no, he was actually working up under the crown directly. They got him, so they got him right before he created uh, the United Negro um, uh, Coalition. What was that? The UNIC? Oh no, what, what improvement? Right? I think that's what I'm missing. But they got him right before he created that, and this is the reason why UNIA, right? And this is the reason why he was able to get certain places that were out that were outside of the United States. He had hope, but notice the lower numbers that he were reading off. One of them was London, and they only had two divisions there. The lower the number, the stronger those divisions are. The reason why I'm saying that is because that was the foundation. And this is the part that Steve didn't get a chance to check out, but I'm sure he would have. Had he went and went further, if you know, but he's not here with us any longer. You know what I'm saying? But I just know if he was here, he would have found that out. Never told us. Just like when we went through the Malcolm thing, we saw they never told us that Malcolm really did attack the Rockefellers. Right. And that Malcolm knew of the boule, but he called him Big Six. Right. Big Six. Right. right. Which was the best he could conceptualize because he didn't know the because whole thing. Because he didn't know. He didn't know the whole but thing. I just got finished saying that earlier. For a cohesive element of black men who are being used to compromise all other black people. Right. Uh -huh. All right? So, so, so we keep that in context. Now let's flip over here. I want to share with you um, something that about the Jewish involvement. Now, part of the reason that black leadership, so-called, is such a butter knife mm. is that at a specific moment, white people showed up and made a scientific decision that we have to get in the front of that nigger parade because that will be our leverage with the other whites. Now, let me go. Let's put the year 1915 on the top of my forehead. Go before that. 
pre-1915, uh -huh. there is no record of Jewish philanthropy in the black community. Now, 1915. Hold on, that made that's a big deal because a lot, and this is the reason why I said a lot of this stuff started at the top of the 1900s, especially with them telling you the lies that I'm exposing. Like, for example, that we all came from Africa. Because prior to that, where did you get that from? Who who told you this? Who told you this? And then you never found out who created Afro-American studies. That All of these videos are on my channel, just in case y'all need to go back. But that's very important. And that was even before the racial attack, I mean, not the, yeah, racial attack react um, of 1924. And that was before the riot that happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921. That time period is so critical. And I'm, I, de I believe it was a little bit more than half of my channel is dedicated to that time period because of what happened. But I'm so glad that it, it, it linked right back up to what he's saying. In the black community, 1915. Now you remember that the Urban League and NAACP was 1908, 1909, mm -hmm. and all the rest of that. You remember that? All right, wait, I just want to make sure it's wet. So, but these were predominantly being assisted by Angolos. <clears throat> and that the Angolos were, in fact, the ones that they all sought to be with, the Jewish philanthropists as well as the talented Tim. Because they're the same. In fact, it mentions that there emerged an alliance. Mm -hmm. This is where you got to go back to the black. This will come out in the black and Jews thing. We'll go into this a little deeper. But that this so-called alliance that we've had started with Jewish wealthy and college-educated blacks. That was the alliance. Now that's significant, it, just to rehash it. What is significant about Jewish wealthy setting up an alliance with the best of the blacks, which were only college-educated blacks? Mm -hmm. In other words, the so-called alliance never started equally because there were no black wealthy to align with Jewish wealthy to make it a mutual alliance. Now, Never from the beginning. Now, that's a mistake, okay? And the reason why, I, I'm not saying at that time that he knew, but I know now that it was a lot of wealthy people that got involved with the Jews because I started pointing them out. When I started, and he didn't know this neither. I'm sure he didn't, but for example, Fre to go further back, Frederick Douglass was wealthy. Just as an example, Frederick Douglass was wealthy. How was Frederick Douglass able to save each and every branch of the Freedmen's Bureau from crashing in 1875? Where did he get his money from? And see, this is what a lot of our people were making a mistake at. They didn't realize that we had the money. <coughs> we were the biggest capitalists at this time. All the way up into the 1900s, this is the reason why they said it was a Great Depression, because it was what was being depressed were them, not us. <laughs> we were good. And we, we, involved, we were involved um, in the Senate. And, okay, so we basically had say-so with this government. Then they flipped the script. Remember, the birth of a nation, not the one where they're talking about Nat Turner. I'm talking about the original birth of a nation. OK, when the um, the KKK got together and actually made a documentary about themselves and the first time it was played, it was played at the White House to the president. This is what they were creating. They were creating national. I mean, uh, uh, nativism. Remember, I went over that part dealing with the um, the Native American Party. If you could go back on that video, I was referring to the Native American Party. That was the first time that you ever heard, ever heard of the term Native American. That's where they got that from. The Native Americans, or AKA the know nothings, according to what the newspapers were saying. They would say they know nothing because anytime they asked them a question about their organization, they would say, I know nothing. I know nothing. I know nothing. And remember, I showed y'all that Trump did the same thing. Okay, he answered just like that. I know nothing about this. I know nothing about that. But there's a particular group of people that are set inside of that secret organization for that reason. And they were all foreigners. I told you who they were. I broke it all the way down. 
and I shared my sources. And these people are working against you, just like the Protestants. And I'm not trying to go on a religious note, but they also are part of a secret society. Just like certain people don't know that Christianity is a part of a society. Let's let's be real here. It's the it's denominations of that society right now. <laughs> like you you think they off the hook? <laughs> like because they practice a religious belief? No. They are all in bed together. <laughs> like, and they are against you this entire time. And look, I'm gonna show you how it started. Well, actually, it started with religion first, then it immediately went to the schools. And he I know he's gonna say so something about it. The blacks it. who were gathered up to be the alliance partners to the Jewish wealthy were in fact college educated blacks or as they say here a talented temp blacks which meant that all the blacks had now he's not power. he's not saying temp he's saying 10th 10th okay the number 10th were was the concept of let me go back a little bit a talented temp blacks which meant that all the blacks had for power was the concept of a group of blacks who would get authority over the other 90%. That was Du Bois's concept of a leadership. Ooh, that deserves, that deserves, yes, go back. College educated blacks, or as they say here, a talented temp blacks. Which meant that all the blacks had for power was the concept of a group of blacks who would get authority over the other 90%. What's that, y'all? Hold up. What is that? Talented Tim. That's 10%. And the rest of the 90%, that 10% is in charge of. What is that? What is that? Y'all should be familiar with what this is. I'm, I'm looking at the chat. There's a terminology for it that we didn't even know, right? And we're looking at it. I mean, we're utilizing it right now. Paying tithes? No, uh. Not that privileged? Not quite. Not quite. No, and okay, not okay. I'm referring to a people. I'm referring to a people, a group of people. It's a, it's ten percent sitting back, controlling the ninety percent, and trying to get them to do what the 10% say. This is the reason why I use the term 13%. I throw it back at them. This is not only a play on words, it's a play on numbers because they speak in code. Code meaning numbers literally. This is the reason why I throw the number 13 back in their face. What they want the 10% to do with the 90% is to make it seem like they are unifying. When the 10% is there to separate. Remember that entire time they were there to desegregate. Right? Divide. Because once you divide the people, the people can be conquered, divide and conquer. That's what the 10% is there for. To control the narrative. That was Du Bois's concept of, of a leadership. leadership. The talented Tim. And that that concept of leadership is what he offered to the white man to have the white man assist them in being that leadership. That the talented tenth was not a statement of guarantee with our people. Our people didn't conceive of the concept. It wasn't taken to us for ratification. It was a separating of the community in an organized decision. Ooh, it was the separate. Look, look, look. To have the white man assist them in doing that leadership. Listen, God that damn it. the talented tenth was not a statement of guarantee with our people. Our people didn't conceive of the concept. It wasn't taken to us for ratification. 
It was a separating of the community in an organized decision by a weak element that felt itself intellectually superior. Mm -hmm. But in fact was not more relevant, more helpful. Nope. What was not identifiably any better than anyone else who could have been the leadership mm -hmm. so far. Now, let me hook it in with you right here. And that's how they get you. They may pretend like they're one of you. They could slip right in. That's what I'm trying to tell y'all. They could slip right in, and they had been for the longest. They had been. And it doesn't have to be a person like, for example, like Jay-Z. It don't have to be that, uh, like a billionaire. It don't have to be. It could, once again, the person could look like you and I on a normal, all the way around, overall. Like normal, regular, original. It could be the person across the street. It could be a person in the grocery store. It could be the doctor that you're going to go see. It could be the barber that you're going to go see. The stylist, hairstylist that you're going to go see. It could be the mechanic that you're going to go see. It could be the, you understand what I'm saying? But they got to have a particular pedigree. This is the reason why it's only 10%. want to bring something together right on top of this. That'll make it uh, real interesting. It says here. The, uh, nah, the Umar Johnson, the clown. Is David Levering Lewis parallels and divergencies assimilation them. strategies of Afro-American and Jewish elites from 1910 to 19. I'm gonna tell you why that Umar Johnson ain't with them because if he was with them, his school would have been put up the same year he was talking about it. He ain't with them. He's not because I'm telling you, the 10 percent are funded. Umar too much of a clown. Is David Levering Lewis parallels and divergencies assimilation strategies of Afro-American and Jewish elites from 1910 to 1930. Now, as I said, I have never been one for Negro history. But now the 1910 to 1930 period is That's important why I got to you, us Steve. I in got our you back. investigation because the spy story has told us that Something happened in 1917. Yeah, the talented tent. That's WB's tent. The formulation Book. of the boule. Hold on. A predominant Levante, that's correct. I'm going to go back. That's that's correct. The uh, W.E.B. Du Bois has the book called The Talented Ten. So he's quoting from that, but just letting you know that some of that information is inside of the book that he was holding up up under his arm originally called Bridges, Boundaries, African-Americans and American Jews. So just in case y'all want to look this up, Levante, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, Talented Tenth is by W.E.B. Du Bois. And Bridges and Boundaries, African Americans and American Jews. It had multiple different authors. So, but just type in the name. I've never been one for Negro history, but now the nineteen. Now he said that he was never for one for Negro history, and I and I understand that because I believe this was at a time that he was stepping away from what was being taught because of who was teaching it and who was in charge of it and who created that curriculum. And this is the reason why I'm exposing not only Afro American history. Black history, American history, I'm exposing it all because everything is tied to it. They had to give it to you in order for you to consent. They gave you the lie so you can, can, uh, can consent to their invincible regime. The land is being divided by invincible lines. The people are being divided by invincible lines. Can you hear me out there? I hope you can. 1930 period is important to us in our investigation because the spy story has told us that something happened in 1917, only 13 years after the formulation of the boule, a predominant assignment had developed and that that assignment gave the impression that maybe uh, maybe uh, uh, this was a set up to be the spy system. The argument simply stated that there is a time when a small number of socially powerful and politically privileged Jews and African Americans embrace the ideology of extreme cultural assimilationism that 
Although this ideology was empathetically, not without paradox or illogic, its ultimate consequence entailed the abandonment of identity and that these two elites, one wealthy and pri primarily German Jewish, mm. the other largely Northern and college trained African American, reacted See? to threats to their hegemony from both within and from outside their ethnic universe, uh, universes, decided to concert many of their undertakings in the belief that group assimilation could accelerate through strategies of overt and covert assistance. Through overt and covert mm -hmm. assistance. Mm -hmm. Influential Jews and talented 10th African Americans feared within a short span of time they would be powerless to promote their social and political programs because of nativism. Other members of... There you go. Because of nativism. Remember, now, I know his research at that time was limited on what nativism was, but I explained, further explained, in further detail what nativism is. You have to go back on my channel and look at that video because that is very important. That's dealing with only foreigners and not even us. Their agenda was to, I'm talking about, not only align people to betray our people, but to get us out of the way to make room for other foreigners. That was the overall agenda. Feared within a short span of time, they would be powerless to promote their social and political programs because of nativism. Other members of their groups who were acting ignorant or less civilized. Don't forget, the reason why he said that is because it was two separate groups. The nativists were um, a particular group that included the Protestants. The other groups would have been Christianity or Catholic Christianity. And they were against each other at that time. Okay. Because they felt as though it was a, an agenda. The nativists felt as though it was an agenda to stop them from prevailing while they got here. This is the reason why the USA flag came about. Matter of fact, I have a video on that called the untold truth of the USA flag. The nativist, that was their flag, that USA flag. Originally, our ancestors had the Confederate, what they called the Confederate flags because we had confederations before any federations were ever created or designed by remote control, by the way, because they're not even here. By remote control, like this government, for example, U.S. Incorporated is a federation. When technically, when you're saluting to the flag, you're stating a negative affirmation as if you are a nativist when you say, um, um, I, I, how does it start? I, now I'm trying to remember how it starts because I wanted to eliminate that out of my mindset that you pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. But they're only referring to their people. This is the reason why people are making the wrong, I mean, big mistake in correlating the Statue of Liberty as if it was referring to them like slaves in America. You got to go back on that video, too, about the truth about the Statue of Liberty, because, no, it was strictly about empowering progress, progress, Egypt, Egypt, progress. That's what it that's what it stands for. It's referring to the empowerment of other for of other foreigners this entire time. It was never done for our benefit ever. We did not create that Pledge of Allegiance at all. We had no if, ands, or buts as far as the say-so was concerned in that meeting that took place that came about, you know, where that uh, Pledge of Allegiance came about. You're stating a, naf a, a negative affirmation to some type of a flag that has nothing to do with you to a people that, ain't, that don't give a crap about you this entire time in other words assimilation would be messed up by someone who didn't know how to eat right and speak right white white it was all about them 
It was all and about them and only a certain says, group of them, not the all of them. The set off among old stock Americans by uncontrolled migration from Eastern Europe and the Deep South. Many poor whites coming from Eastern Europe, many so-called poor blacks coming from up south. Going Triggering, north. in turn, divisive and strident cultural and political nationalisms among the unabsorbed, increasingly despised newcomers. Now, it also contained documents of different people uh, speaking against migration, uh, which was interesting because uh, the See? Urban League and many others got in the forefront of calling for blacks to stay in the South. Uh, and that raised a lot of other uh, adjoining questions. What the familiar details of the beginnings of anti American anti-Semitism do not adequately explain is why Jewish involvement with African Americans greatly intensified after 1915, taking on an urgency of a special mission. Why Jews of influence and wealth rapidly moved from racial altruism, altruism barely distinguishable from that of a neo-abolitionist and parlor socialist wasp to virtual management of African-American organizations. Virtual management of. By remote control. What debate there was. It says available literature is silent about pre-1915 debate. What literature there was was abruptly resolved by August 17, 1915 lynching of Leo Frank of Marriott, Georgia. Frank was a Cornell University graduate whose grandfather had been a decorated Confederate officer and leading Atlanta businessmen. Leo Frank was head of the anti, excuse me, head of B'nai B'rith in Atlanta. Leo Frank was head of B'nai B'rith in Atlanta. And of course, Leo Frank was the first white man in the history of America to be solely convicted on the testimony of a black man. Now that so scared the Jewish people, so scared the Jewish people, because the Jewish people, Jewish philanthropists, old line Jewish philanthropists said, we should not get caught helping the Negro, for it is not good to help America's pariah, for we too will be looked at as the pariah's assistant. And since we're trying to escape being the pariah of Europe, we won't get caught helping the Negro yet. That was the pre-1915. But when the head of the International Order of B'nai B'rith in Atlanta gets hung for raping a white woman solely on the testimony of a black man, they got scared of this shit. That scared them. That's when they ran out and formed the Anti-Defamation League. Because that's when they knew that if a black man could convict a Jewish man, white man in America, that they better get out quick and get some sort of organization to protect them. Because to them it couldn't have been anything lower. <laughs> Says here, listen to this. Says that um, accused of the murder rape of a white female, he was the first white man in post bellum South to be convicted on the capital offense on the testimony of an African American. The incendiary speeches of Tom Watson, the nearly demented Georgia populist leader, and the barbarianism of Marietta Mob made it clear that the victim's punishment had been determined by race and class rather than by regard for evidence. The Frank Clay's case also briefly threatened Afro-American Jewish goodwill when the Jewish-owned New York Times demanded that the Georgia authorities try the African-American janitor, the sole witness to the crime, as the guilty party. Now that book talks yeah, about their relationship. Yeah. Man, hey, okay. not only is he not guilty, but try the nigga. You know what you're supposed to do. It's a nigga against all of us. It says there were many use of distinctions. It says that the Jewish leaders preferred leaders of accommodation rather than of protest. When the Jewish people start to get involved, ha having uh, been afraid by what happened, when the Jewish people start getting involved, um, they talk about that they start looking for blacks in the various cities that had pedigree. The word pedigree was used. Go. Now, in the article condemning me uh, by uh, 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 this guy Taylor Branch in here, 
in, in condemning me, he said, Coakley lacked pedigree. Therefore, he was like a, a scavenger fish type of thing. It says here that during the ascendancy of Booker T. Washington, militant Afro-American spokesmen in the North had commanded little of the loyalty of the masses of their own people, nor the attention of white philanthropy, to say nothing of the heed of the politicians. The death of the great accommodator in November of 1915 opened a crisis in race leadership. In that, in that already became apparent that the Bookerite philosophy of African American development through subordinate agriculture and trades was far more suited for the rural South. By 1917, perhaps as many as 250,000 Southern African Americans were resettled in urban North and East. And Bookerites had a few answers to socioeconomic crisis raised by the Great Migration. Consequently, many of the great industrial philanthropists turned from Tuskegee and Hampton Institute's political cadres to the urban, mostly northern men and women who had never forewarned faith in full civil and social equity and for whom the NAACP's Du Bois, Boston's William Monroe Trotter, Washington's Francis Grimke, and Kelly Miller and Chicago's Ida B. Wells him. Barnett were heroes. Those were the radically racial men and women with whom socially constructive, conservative Jewish elite would form an alliance. Many of the talented 10th were stamped in what E. Franklin Frazier called the genteel tradition of the small group of mulattoes who assimilated the morals and manners of slaveholding aristocracy. But the nucleus was hmm. free black. Descended from tiny colonial population, uh, populations concentrated in Boston, Brooklyn, and Philadelphia, the founding place of the Boule, mm. and Providence, Rhode Island, gradually augmented by underground railroad fugitives, and after the Civil War by Southerners with some or all of the endowments of pedigree, professional distinction, good morals, and affordable racial mixture, that is, derived from antebellum liaisons. A few names, See? Fortin, Herodin, Purvis, Spyhax, Trotter, Whipper, Downey, represented the moderate <laughs> fortunes from real estate, insurance, publishing, medicine, hosteling, and construction. They also wanted but, you to have like a white wife also, or if you were the female, they wanted you to have a white husband. Okay, they wanted that. That was a part of the pedigree. Not only the moral standards, but they wanted your relationship a certain way also. Most were from the generations of solid middle class incomes. Middle the class income. Was exemplified by the National Urban League leadership of the early 20s. Eugene Kinkle Jones and George Edmund Hayes. Opportunity editor Charles S. Johnson. Chicago Urban League director T. Arnold Hill. All of whom were sons of professional fathers second generation college products second generation mm. so you only have one group of college educated men when the boule starts off you actually got the second generation right. of college educated men so on your second turn the white man guarantees that crowd crowd one and crowd two perpetual leadership because in here it says that if you agreed to be a part of this you could at least have leadership for 40 years why they picked 40, I don't know. Interestingly enough, it makes a comment about that when the Jewish people joined philanthropy, it allowed them to do something for other whites. It says, the Jewish civil rights role relieved the DuPonts, the Fords, the Mellons, the Rockefellers, and families. other genteel capitalists Gentile. from the burden of more infrequent ceremonial contact with African-American leaders and organizations, mm -hmm. which in turn <clears throat> somewhat vaguely obligated those capitalists to closer ties with Jewish financiers and philanthropists. So they got the banks. See what I'm saying? That because the Jewish people showed up and relieved the DuPonts, the Astors, the Rockefellers, the Mellons, the Fords, etc., from Proctors. spending their time or wasting their time giving their money away to Negroes in hump and pop ceremony mm -hmm. that the Jewish community came in and became that tender to the black leadership which obligated the Carnegie's, Mellon's, DuPont's and others to fraternize with Jewish philanthropy 
for assisting them on the Negro question. So that when they tell you we've been a partner in the Black Jewish Alliance, you tell them, my knowledge is that the riches of you circumvented the riches of the Anglo whites who you sought to get with at the museum and the art institute and the symphony orchestra and the opera of which you had not been allowed hmm. to be on yet African American by giving museum. philanthropy to the Negro who you never hung with Smithsonian you in fact tended to an obligation that the white race had to keep niggas cool mm -hmm. and that for that for example Japan and Germany want to come in on the world thing so every time something come up, America say, well, Japan, you got to put money up for Russia. Japan, Germany, you got to put some money up for Russia. You all got to help pay what it cost us to pay the world off. We'll put you on the Security Council of the UN. We'll put you, but you got to fork up and pay over for the containment of the globe. So in other words, if you're going to Japan enjoy the benefits of a world we dominate they want with military back. strength and violence, you got to pay us for dominating it. And so, and so, for the Jewish philanthropists to be included in the Anglophiles, which was what both groups aspired, the blacks and the Jewish people, aspired to be up there, they had to show that they would foot the bill. So when they go into that dialogue about, and boy, I, I couldn't imagine them ever showing up for a real meeting over <laughs> history, but God, we could, we could have a trial, we could try black-Jewish relations. And look, and that's so that, and, that, and I took that, I, I I just took that to heart right there because it's so many things that we could get them for right now. There's so many things that we could get them for, and you know it would be hilarious for us to just take them to court for just the things that they did. As far as the history is concerned, with all the evidence that I have, I, I I've been a couple of times. I didn't came out and said, look, I'm looking for some lawyers and some attorneys that ain't scared, that got the balls. That's going to actually try to do this thing for real. Like, I mean, I'm talking about Supreme Court lawsuits left and right. Left and right. Now, listen to this. In fact, uh, the guy Villard said, well, we I've can never do it for appealed fun. to them for aid to the Negro and been rebuffed. Villard, Villard was the first uh, Anglo or white. He was the first chairman of the NAACP of which Spingard then followed him. But Villard only stayed there until Du Bois attacked Villard and made him leave, which brought Spingard in. Yeah. And you must remember that, too. It's a preferred leadership. Now, it says here that support of and participation in African-American civil rights movement was seen after 1915 as meeting Jewish needs. When barely 10 years... Whoa, 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 whoa. After 1915, see, a lot of people was thinking just the civil rights was 1966. And remember, I told you it was three of them. And I told you there was a section in there for the Indians, and there was definitely a section in there for them foreigners here. The name of this book that he's holding up is called Bridges and Boundaries, African Americans, American Jews. I'm going to say it again. Bridges, Boundaries. African Americans, American Jews. Get this. And participation in African American civil rights movement was seen after 1915 as meeting Jewish needs. When barely 10 years earlier, they had supported those African American forces, the Bookerites only. It says, in the aftermath of the Frank case, upper-class Jews increasingly encouraged the new African-American leadership, the talented 10th, mm -hmm. which employed agitation and publicity as principal weapons to force the glacial pace of civil rights. By look, establishing look, hold up, hold up, Steve. Listen to what he just said, y'all. They telling you the agenda. The talented 10th which employed agitation and publicity agitation as and publicity principal weapons as principal weapons to force the glacial pace of civil rights force the glacial By pace of civil rights <sighs> I'm trying to tell you set it on fire. fire establishing a presence at the center of the civil rights movement with intelligence money and influence Elite Jews and their delegates could fight against anti-Semitism by
by remote control. Woo, what I say? What I say? You see, when Copley gets attacked, I'll show you all the stories. They say, where are our responsible black leaders? Meaning, where are the ones that we paid to attack in a situation like this? Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's right. And, and so, in other words, they're going There's to no time, fight bro. the attack on themselves by remote control. By remote in other control. Words, if LeGrand Clegg says that Jewish people have dominated the influence of Hollywood and have portrayed negative images, and then by noon, Ben Hooks condemns him, the man who he was speaking for. They didn't have to fight LeGrand's so-called anti-Semitism because by remote control, they could clock the niggas to do it. Send a coon in there. That was the point. <clears throat> to be able to clock you a nigga to show up. No bull. That's why they put niggas in the forefront of all their fights. That's right. Every single like time. Little sister was head and Planned Parenthood. And they know how to do that. Mm hmm. Mary Wright Edelman, she's theirs too. Uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton, she's theirs too. Mm. Uh, Listen to this. Talk. This is deep. Julius Rosenwald became a trustee of the Rockefeller Foundation in 1922. This is very important because the Rosenwald Fund had always given out a lot of money to black schools. Uh -oh. In fact, by the time Rosenwald hooks up with Rockefeller in the 20s, he had already given away $4 million to secondary and primary schools in the South. Mm -hmm. In the South. Mm -hmm. Now, what was important about Rosenwald coming on the board of the Rockefeller Foundation was that it meant that they would unify their philanthropy efforts. Mm -hmm. That was important because you couldn't have one group of whites building up the wrong set of niggas. <laughs> oh, by design. <laughs> so you had to have a clearinghouse so that you could check with your army man to find out who the troublemakers were mm -hmm. because you never give money to a troublemaker. The word in their bill is don't feed the teachers. So remember that phrase. That's the, That's that true. hangs up up in them foundations, it said right on the wall, don't feed the teachers. Yeah. And then the subline is feed the dumb and the ambitious. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> now, Julius Rosenwald became a trustee of the Rockefeller Foundation in 22. After distributing more than four million or less out of his pocket to build schools for Southern blacks. Now remember that book. I mentioned to you the book by Carter G. Woodson and uh, where that? There you go, show you right. I mentioned this book here because this is the book that will show you exactly everywhere that Rosenwald put that money, everywhere the Pew Foundation put their money, everywhere the Rockefellers put their money. It's in a chapter called Educational Development. And in that chapter, it just lays out tons. It says the education of the Negro, however, has continued in the hands of whites and the Negroes themselves being largely the objects of such efforts. This results from the fact that in the main it is a concern of the government and Negroes are not permitted to figure conspicuously in this sphere. Mm. The philanthropists are not to be blamed for this. They are merely dealing with the situation as they found it. The public functioning functioners believe that it ensures to their special program to direct the mental development of the Negro along the lines which is not prejudicial to their interest. Woo. To develop the Negro along the lines which is not prejudicial to their interest. Woo. And some of them, discarding the economic principle that the consumer pays the tax, boldly assert that since they are financing the education of the Negro, they have to the right to direct it as they will. As they will, they're going to direct it. The education it. of the Negro, therefore, has been largely a process of telling the Negro what someone else wants him to say or do oh. and watching him do it in automatic Order fashion. Hey, lay, hey, 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 hey. Has been largely a process of telling the Negro what someone else wants him to say or do and watching him do it in automatic fashion. Mm. Listen, this is what this is what's been going on still to this day.
The educational system is the exact same way. Nothing changed. Clear as day. Negro in our history called the educational development. The Negro in our history, Carter G. Woodson. The Negro in our history, Carter G. Woodson. That's the name of this book. Page 572. 572. Page 572. Carter G. Woodson and Charles Wesley. And Charles, Charles Wesley, Wesley. Of, course, of course, wrote the history book of the Boule. Charles Wesley wrote the history book of the Boule. Uh oh. And Carter G. Woodson worked with him to make this book and the miseducation of the Negro and the education of the Negro that informs us that Carter G. Woodson was also there as a plant. Carter G. Woodson wrote The Miseducation of the Negro. <laughs> And the education of the Negro. Correct. Outstandingly correct. The General Education Board. Anytime you're researching the, the past, you see the word General Education Board. That was the forerunner to the Rockefeller Foundation. That was his name before it became called the Rockefeller Foundation. Yeah. It was Rockefeller's foundation, the General Education Fund. It's just that it become, it was just that, an education fund. He was putting his money in it. It says the General Education Fund in dealing with the problem of Negro education in the South has consistently tried to aid the various education agencies of the states in their endeavors. In 1910, the Peapotty Education Fund, the Southern Education Board, enabled Virginia to employ a state grant for Negro rural schools. The following year, the General Education Board took over the support of this work and extended the offer to other southern states. Kentucky, Alabama, Arkansas responded at once and they were closely followed by North Carolina and Tennessee. By 1914, Georgia was added. By 1919, each of the southern states had an appointed state agent for Negro rural schools as a member of the staff of the State Department of Edu Education paid for by the Rockefeller family. Now, the Rockefeller got in charge just because of the money that he was funding. Now, this, is, this goes to show you that we also had our own schools and was funding it. OK, but he came in and talked, talked, made them an offer that they couldn't refuse. They saw that money. They was like, and we running low on funds. Matter of fact, we'll run with that. And then he got control of every single school that we had originally. Oh, he had built him a Negro superintendent of Negro school development in every state. In every state. Now, if you have someone compiling a list of troublemakers, it doesn't make any difference unless you got access to controlling where a troublemaker may reside. Mm -hmm. Like at compulsory school, school. Mm -hmm. where everybody's forced to go. Mm -hmm. Now, if you got this sophistication of a system going, you can, in fact, start steering the student. Start uh -huh. steering the student. Start steering the student. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Coakley. One of our good brothers. He been doing it for quite some time. And I definitely want to give him his props because he deserved it. He deserved it. Now it was, of course it was more than that, but me personally, I wanted to get to the, to the meat of everything that he was talking about. And I wanted you to see that portion. There is more. I do have more, which I want to do. Because, I mean, if you want to pick up, you know, pick up on this tomorrow or we can continue on right now. Because I, there is more. Um, and if you that that may be that may be a little deep right there. And I don't want to overcrowd you with a bunch of information. I just want this to be able to sink in so you can understand where we are coming from here. And what we dealing with here, we talking about our own people that's selling us out, that's working for a set group of people that don't look like you and I, and they doing it for the money and they doing it for the fame and they doing it to think that they're going to be able to have wealth within their family for generations to come. But they actually get cut short. Don't forget that he said for 40 years, this is a job. This is a task. This is what they signed up for. They signed in a, li a dotted line. Remember when people say you signing your life away? That's what they were doing in a literal sense. These people are out there and they're working against you. And they are called the gatekeepers. They are called the gatekeepers. 
This is what we have to combat. These people have been out here for the longest. We talking top of 1900s here. When all those foreigners got together and created their own correlations. Now, I remember telling you um, in one of the one, one of my previous videos, I said, um, and let me see if I could find that really quickly, because they allow they also allow our people to self-determine who they are. But all of that was happening at the same time because of nativism. They wanted people to take over our spots, not only by our link, but erasing our, uh, or uh, stealing our history. They're also stealing our cultures, traditions, uh, our way of life, our uh, spiritual practices. They were doing this by design. And our people had no idea because the majority of them were in school thinking they were getting the best education now that the Rockefellers was able to put their funds behind their schools. And they had a totally different agenda. During the early to mid 1800s, the offsprings of previous foreigners of European descent that migrated to North America prior to this great migrational period were threatened by the increase of even more foreigners being welcomed as citizens of America. These people were referred to as nativists who carried a lifestyle of prejudice and bigotry, racial discrimination, racial political views, and biased religious beliefs. As more immigrants flocked to North American shores, migrating to cities and towns all across the East Coast, the nativists' beliefs turned deadly. By causing riots to arise and attempts to greet the newly incoming foreigners with resistance. For example, in July of 1844, it was said that a riot took place in the city of Philadelphia. Don't forget, that's where the boule arise. Where a large group of nativists burnt down two Catholic churches in a Catholic school, killing 20 or so people in the process. Now, I'm sure many of you can recall some major events that occurred during that same time period, like the Indian Removal Act of 1830, for example, where President Andrew Jackson forced Indians living all throughout the East Coast of America to migrate to lands west of the Mississippi River. And then they came up with another great, great migration at the late 1800s, top of 1900s, and tried to move the rest of the Negroes that stayed, tried to move them north, right? It's all lining up. They were trying to get you out of the way, and they had to use your own people against you in order for that to happen. In the latter part of the year 1849, a, polit a politician by the name of Charles B. Allen created the Order of the Star-Spangled Banner, which is OSSB, in the state of New York. It was a secret society formed in order to stand against the immigration of incoming foreigners of British, Irish, German, Japanese, and Chinese descent to the United States and anybody else who practiced Catholicism as their religious choice. So you had the Protestants against the Catholics. In order to join the society, you had to be required to follow their rules. A requirement was that you had to have been a Protestant for at least 21 years. You must uncritically obey all orders and political policies established under their oath of their society. A lot of our people were ordered by the same society to betray us. And notice how I'm talking about late 1800s because the, the motive was there, but it started going in motion at the top of the 1900s when they had certain people in place politically. This is why you see this picture right here and everybody sitting down at the table. You got the all seeing now above them. They're all looking at the all seeing eye. They're all in this together. They're up under the same umbrella. They're up under the same web. 
That's why they say circle within a circle. That's what it's called. These are the gatekeepers. They are against your people. Now, don't get me wrong. They're against all people that are not their people, but they're especially against you. Goes back to what Cube was saying. If you're not a part of their club, they don't care about you. If you don't want to be a part of their club and they want you, they're going to try everything in their power to tear you down. And their money talk. And they all in bed together, meaning well, whoever they got to pay to send the media probably already a part of that club or some club that's associated with that club. A big web. No, I didn't say that's God's eye. I didn't say that. I said that was the, that's, they're all seeing eye. There's a reason why they utilize that on a dollar bill still. Right? That's their paper money that they developed within that same time period, right? 1900s? Compulsory education, then, you know, uh, who was that? Did, did the uh, Federal Reserve, um, Woodrow Wilson, the Federal Reserve Act, welcomed in more Jewish bankers and their relationships in. Hey, they took it over from top to bottom, from education all the way up to political uh, governmental positions. They took it all over media, uh, mainstream television, uh, whatever, whatever you doing, they got a, They got their hand in it. Whatever you interest in, whatever you are interested in, they got their hand in it. Well, dang, we can't do nothing about them. I mean, but, I mean, what, what can we do? First of all, you got to know about them so you can recognize them. And it's the reason why they try to shut people like me up, because once I inform you what their agenda was in the past, you'll realize that they're, they say they have the same agenda right now and it's still in play. And if you don't play their game, it dies. If you don't play the game with them, it dies. That's why. So I want to, um, I want to pick this up tomorrow and I'm not playing. I'll be, I'll be here tomorrow. I love you all. Thank you for, you know, coming out and checking us out. I got more to share and I, I'm going to need more time, but it's late. And I know my wife need me. I appreciate that. Y'all thank you all for showing support, hitting the like button, um, commenting, sharing the video. I really appreciate y'all chatting. Shout out to the moderators. Shout out to those that became new members as well. Okay. Shout out to those that even donated. I didn't get a chance to see. I appreciate all the love and support you all. I'm doing this for y'all, for us, because that's what it's about. I'm that type of person. I'm not out here selling you out. That is not my agenda. Never has been. Won't ever be. Okay? Y'all take care. What up? I'm just here to make you think. Sure, dance. Yeah.